It is now my pleasure to turn the program over to our co-host, Brigadier General Thomas Drowdy, who is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Marine Corps University Foundation to open our program. General Drowdy. Thank you very much. It is a real honor and pleasure to be with you again today uh, to co-host uh, this uh, most worthwhile endeavor with the Heritage Foundation. Uh, we're just delighted. Uh, this gives me uh, an opportunity to make a shameless plug for our foundation, and you'll find some materials, but basically we uh, provide uh, resources to enhance and enrich professional military education and leadership to uh, those attending the Marine Corps University as well as the operating forces and supporting establishment. So uh, we believe that we change lives and save lives and hope that you would take a look at our material and uh, consider supporting us. Uh, I also have the honor to introduce uh, Jim Carafano, who is um, the Heritage Foundation's Vice President of Foreign and Defense Policy Studies, E.W. Richardson Fellow and Director of the Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Institute for International Studies. Uh, lots of things in between, a recent book, Wiki at War, Conflict in a Socially Networked World. Uh, Jim is a West Point graduate, uh, served 25 years in the Army, retired as a Lieutenant Colonel, Master's degree and PhD from Georgetown. And uh, Jim is also one of our trustees for the Marine Corps University Foundation. So would you please uh, join me in welcoming Jim Carafano. Well, I, so I'm just so excited to be here. For me, this is like Christmas in November because I get to do four amazing things. First of all, it's, it's amazing the partnership with the Marine Corps University Foundation, which is an absolutely outstanding institution supporting Marine Corps University, which is an incredible crown jewel of professional military education in the United States. And uh, it, it, what they do is so remarkable with such few resources. Uh, and, and the product that they produce is absolutely incredible. It's an honor to be associated with them in any way. As an old Army guy, that comes very painful for me to say. Um, <laughs> and to have John McCaffrey here is just incredible. He is a, not just a, a great soldier and a, and a great veteran, but just an absolute national security treasure. So to have an opportunity to hear him today is, is awesome. But it is just such an honor and a privilege to um, introduce the, the benefactors of the lecture series, who are two just absolutely amazing and incredible people. So Colonel James McGinley has spent his career protecting American interests both at home and abroad. At home, he had a north, noteworthy legal career protecting individuals from insurance bad faith practices by HMOs. In 1996, his success as a litigation partner was highlighted in a cover story in Time Magazine. Separately, Colonel McGinley has served a distinguished 30-year career as a naval aviator in the United States Marine Corps Focusing his leadership school, uh, skills abroad, he volunteered for three combat tours and has earned both the Legion of Merit and the Bronze Star. He retired from the Marine Corps in April of this year. Mary Beth Walton McGinley has spent her life dedicated to conservative principles since the 1980s when she received golden records for art directing the albums E.T., The Extraterrestrial, and Return of the Jedi. Mary Beth has earned an admirable reputation for successful business ownership and creative development focused on the entertainment industry. In 2002, she was appointed by President George W. Bush and confirmed by the full Senate to serve a six-year term as a member of the National Art Council. The McGinleys have a special relationship with Heritage dating back to its earliest days. After serving as the Secretary of Business and Transportation for then Governor Reagan, Mary Beth's father, the Honorable Frank J. Walton served as the president of the Heritage Foundation from 1975 to 1977. The McGinleys are dedicated to the national security of the United States. We at the Heritage Foundation, together with the Marine Corps University Foundation, are proud and absolutely honored that these two amazing, incredible patriots through the annual Colonel G. Uh, D. McGinley Lecture Series have, have, um, have uh, associated their name with, I think, a really important uh, series of lectures. Both the Heritage Foundation and the Marine Corps University Foundation are dedicated to educating the United States and its leaders on vital national security issues. Every year, this lecture will serve to educate and remind us of the need for a strong national defense by looking at the very real threats this nation faces and what we can do to stop them. 
So please join with me in uh, welcoming Colonel Megan Lee to the stage. That and I can tell you it, it truly is an honor to uh, provide just a, a, a bit of structure for what heritage brings in the way of scholarship and focus it on national security. Uh, for us, we are genuinely excited for that opportunity and, and we thank you. Um, I get the privilege today of uh, introducing one of uh, America's great military leaders, uh, General Barry McCaffrey. Uh, for many of you, you have seen General McCaffrey on TV lending his expert advice uh, and counsel to all of us on national security issues. Uh, I think it's oftentimes uh, very important to look to see how uh, general and flag officers transition from their roles within government and how they then take and capitalize on that foundation of expertise. Let me run through his bio very quickly so that for those of you who know the face but don't know the background of a career of service, uh, I think that the information I'm about to give will be extremely helpful. General McCaffrey served in the United States Army for 32 years and retired as a four-star general. At retirement, he was the most highly decorated serving general, having been awarded three Purple Heart Medals for wounds received in his four combat tours, as well as twice awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, the nation's second highest award for valor. In addition, he was twice awarded the Silver Star for valor. For five years after leaving the military, General McCaffrey served as the nation's cabinet officer in charge of U.S. drug policy. Prior to confirmation as the National Drug Policy Director, General McCaffrey served as the Commander-in-Chief of the United States Armed Forces Southern Command coordinating national security operations in Latin America. During his military career, he served overseas for 13 years and completed four combat tours. He commanded 24th Infantry Division during Desert Storm and led the 400 kilometer left hook attack into Iraq. General McCaffrey currently serves as the president of B.R. McCaffrey Associates, providing strategic counseling services to businesses, governments, and international organizations. Ladies and gentlemen, please join with me in welcoming General McCaffrey. Thanks very much, Ken. I don't know if you can mute these speakers at the podium. Technically, can. Well, Jim, thanks very much, you and Mary Beth, for funding uh, not only this lecture, but for your support of Heritage Foundation, which does such a terrific job in adding objectivity to debate about major issues of our time. So I, I really congratulate the two of you. And I, I was dying to meet Jim and find out how somebody could be a big time lawyer in California and also volunteering for combat duty in Iraq. Uh, so thanks for your career of service. And uh, Jim Carafano has been a friend for uh, many years, does a terrific job here. I periodically appear at some, at his behest or others to I give talks, and Jim, I thank you for your leadership, your intellectual leadership in these public policy de debates. Tom Drowdy, where are you, Tom? Uh, thank God for the United States Marine Corps. Tom and I have known each other for a long time. Uh, I guess we were both at Leavenworth, uh, studious <laughs> participants in the year-long uh, course. So we, both of us remind people we were there as students, not as prisoners. <laughs> uh, uh, but Tom's uh, career of service has been absolutely brilliant, and I'm glad to see you here. Mike Meese. By God, raise your hand. His dad, as you know, a distinguished public uh, figure, Attorney General, former Attorney General Mike Meese, and I have worked for Mike and with him over the years as, uh, when he was the Department of Social Sciences uh, head of department, which reminds me of one of my favorite stories. I was a Department XO as a um, major. Uh, one of my most important responsibilities, I graduated from coffee officer to the department executive officer's <laughs> position. And uh, then uh, e e years uh, before me, when, when I first uh, got there, Jim Ellis, any of you know him, retired three-star Alabama boy, terrific soldier, had been the department XO, and I reported in. 
you know, I had just finished two years in graduate school. I was very eager to be there. I was going to teach American government and comparative politics. So I get there, and Jim Ellis uh, uh, is the department XO. And by the way, by background, he has up behind his desk the sword from the Department of Mathematics, uh, saying he was the most brilliant math student, plus or minus several years. He's very proud of that. So when I get in there, he says, Barry, you're going to be my recruiting officer, and you're supposed to identify shiny captains and get them into Harvard or Notre Dame or Stanford or whatever and bring them back. And I said, okay, great. And uh, my screening tool was the graduate record exams. Remember, they were quantitative and verbal. Max was 800, similar to the college SATs. Does this group, you remember your scores? The real one, not the one you've been telling your spouse for the last 20 years. Anyway, my, my target in the Department of Social Sciences, I'd need uh, to see an extremely high verbal score. Let's say 735. But then I'd need a pretty good uh, quantitative score because you couldn't handle economics and quantitative analysis. So I, maybe I'd be looking for 690. I was sitting there going through the 70 some odd officers' files one night. And I get to Jim Ellis's file and I'd open it up, and there it is quantitative 800, which you rarely see. Verbal 309. <laughs> And I w went in to see him, I said, in just utter disbelief, said, Jim, for God's sake, how could you teach in this department? He said, Barry, it's been a problem my entire life. I was the first one who knew the answer, and I couldn't tell nobody. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mike, that was the, the background of your department. Um, Carl McNair, sir, thanks for your lifetime of service. Uh, a friend of my dad's uh, and another uh, distinguished military officer. Look, by way of background, let me um, make some brief remarks and perhaps we can have a conversation. I, um, Heritage will make available some standard slides I use to talk about defense issues. And these were primarily put together to go up and talk to the Harvard International um, uh, Security course uh, a few months back. Um, so they'll be available and perhaps they'll pique uh, your interest. But let, let me talk about a couple of things. First of all, sort of the context of national security then the threat, and then possibly uh, where we're going in the future. But I think the context is important. Um, we're extremely critical uh, as Americans of our own institutions, and probably to good effect also. You know, the last slide I normally show to civilian audiences or international audiences is one talking about uh, the degree to which American people have trust in their major institutions. And I talk about this slide as being a bad news slide for democracy. Gallup poll uh, does a, the survey uh, every June. Uh, when you look at it, uh, you see, you know, trick question in American government, three co-equal branches of government. What's the most important branch of government, bar none, hey, Pancho, uh, is uh, Congress. And the reason is because they control the money you know, Colin, Colin Powell used to tell us, don't tell me about your programs, tell me about your budgets. Uh, they control the money. Standing of Congress in this society is the lowest of all the major institutions, normally in the single digits, 9%. How can you be an operative democracy uh, with a Congress, that, that, with a legislative body that lacks that kind of credibility? And many other institutions, uh, the media, you can't be a free society without an aggressive, objective media. And yet the media, both TV and print, are well down below 50%. The most trusted institution in American society year after year, bar none, is the U.S. Armed Forces, followed quickly by law enforcement. And there's a reason for it. It's because you're, you know, our boys and girls, our sons and daughters, write mom and say, I'm an in, part of an institution of courage and integrity, and they care about me as a person, and they're developing me as a person. It's an astonishing situation, uh, the trust the American people have of their armed forces. Now, those armed forces have a lot of challenges. But again, to put it in context, uh, you know, it always amuses me the debate over new institutions of national security that we need and we should be building, a public health service, a border patrol uh, uh, and, and customs service adequate to defend 
5,000 miles of Canadian borders, 2,000 miles of Mexico, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, Caribbean. These institutions are anemic. You know, we talk about are we overspending on TSA at uh, 40,000 people? When you look at the Department of Defense, the largest um, department in our government, it's 2.3 million men and women in the armed forces deployed globally in 5,000 different places uh, with an astonishing array of technology, training, leadership, and capability. And by the way, it's battle-hardened. It's astonishing the experience of that fighting force, every piece of it. More than 400,000 of our troops have been deployed three or more times. And by the way, when we look at it, we talk about the National Guard and the Reserves, we could not have pr uh, prosecuted these two conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan without the almost full-time commitment of the reserve components. It's an astonishing capability. Second set of observations, you know, and I, um, I have an advantage over many of you since I taught economics at West Point, and I'm sure I don't understand how it works. But having said that, uh, when you look at our economy, you know, I always try and get uh, some sort of objective starting data points. We still have the largest economy on the face of the earth, bar none. And depending on how you gauge it, the manufacturing sector still leads the rest of the world, particularly in many high-tech applications, IT, aviation, pharmaceuticals, uh, et cetera. We're still the leading agricultural producing nation on the face of the earth. Uh, we're now seeing the return to manufacturing, thank God. And there's a lot of reasons for that. 3D printing, uh, competitive uh, costs of transportation, uh, but a lot of American firms had outsourced everything to include their back office to China and India and elsewhere are now returning those business practices to the United States. Um, energy. Uh, I watched, you know, this class up at uh, Harvard. I had a PLO terrorist and some Nigerian oil ministers, et cetera, dotted throughout the crowd, and their eyes widened when I said, there's a good argument that by 2020, we'll be the leading oil-producing nation on the face of the earth. We already have a massive increase in natural gas production, a tremendous uh, change in what's economically feasible given fracking, horizontal drilling, uh, Canadian oil tar sands, et cetera. It's just amazing. Uh, the, uh, and by the way, the conservation uh, of energy expenditure has been dramatic over the last 15 years also. Uh, the percentage of our energy consumption that comes from foreign sources has dropped steadily year after year. And we really haven't started because you can't run an energy efficient U.S. economy unless you include the use of nuclear power. We now have five nuclear power plants that will come online in the coming 10 years, principally in the southeast. Uh, but I think the bottom line is that that, uh, that, that economic equation, although we've had terrible uh, problems, uh, is coming back. It was built upon 307 million people with tremendous educational basis uh, with a, a deteriorating but a substantial uh, national transportation infrastructure. Now, when you talk about educational systems, by the way, uh, we do have a problem. We need less people studying massage therapy and recreational management and more people doing STEM studies. Uh, so we, we have some challenges. But having said that, you know, the Saudi royal family don't send their boys or girls to madrasas in Pakistan. They send them here to the United States for schooling. And we, by the way, when they need medical care, they come here. And they want to do banking, they come here. Uh, so I think there's a good argument that the, that the foundation of U.S. power is mostly based on our value systems, our economy, and then sort of in a tertiary sense on this immensely powerful armed forces. Uh, and I think most of that is still moving in the right direction. Now, what's the security challenge? I just had a great interview with two high IQ heritage uh, folks downstairs. You know, what's a major security challenge facing the United States? I would argue uh, the principal challenge is our majors. The O4s of the Navy, Air Force, uh, Army, Marines, Coast Guard. And I say that because the... Um, 
as a general statement, you know, the flag officers that tend to manage and create and shape uh, the military of the coming 20 years are the most successful majors of the force. And they internalize some of these lessons, primarily at the grade of captain, where they were immensely capable people. And they're thinking the same thoughts 20 years later when they're senior flag officers in charge of the armed forces. And the situation won't be the same. You know, I used to joke, I always, I found a trick uh, to advance my own interest in the Pentagon, the J, uh, J-5 in the Pentagon, which was hiring nuke submarine guys to work for me. I went, I went and tried to get some 40 nuke submarine captains. They have nothing to do with them once they hit the grade of 05. Uh, they have multiple graduate degrees in science. They're anal retentive. Uh, they think it's a good deal if you send them home every 90 days to briefly visit their family. <laughs> so I, I amassed all these nuke submarine guys to work for me, and they were just phenomenal. But as a general statement, if you show a nuke submarine guy a problem, the answer is a nuke submarine. <laughs> so you, you really have to be careful what will the threats be that we will face in the future. And the answer from a successful major is, we're going to create the military force that could have won in Iraq and Afghanistan minus the nonsense uh, of the uh, way we actually intervene. We've got to think through that. What are we supposed to be doing 20 years from now? By the way, that shouldn't be a primary job of the flag officers. That's the job of the commander in chief, the secretary of defense, and the U.S. Congress. And they're not doing it. So it's sort of a shallow debate. Uh, pivoting to the Pacific. If the budget doesn't follow the white paper, nothing's actually happening. Uh, second uh, observation, you know, for many of us my age, our entire life was involved with weapons of mass destruction, NBC, Nuke Chem Bio. I did it from the grade of captain on, Prefix 5 certified as a captain. All of our military services had actively deployed nuclear devices, and we were prepared prepared to use them. We had parallel universe of the PRP program and two-man control systems, and we rehearsed them, and we made separate institutions to control these weapons. In the last 20 years, there's nobody in uniform or in Congress that wants to be seen as a proponent of nuke weapons. And the, the force is starting to lose its scientific and policy and training credibility. At some, point in, in, at some point in the future, whether that's 10 years from now or 25 from years, uh, the really bright lieutenant colonels in Iran and elsewhere in North Korea will say, we don't think that system of theirs works anymore. There's a book out right now that's absolutely earth-shaking. Uh, unclassified information this clever writer got access to that talks about uh, the declining uh, state of the, of the U.S. nuclear system. Uh, we just simply aren't concentrating on it. And I would argue the primary way you deal with uh, nuclear devices isn't to use them. It's to have political, diplomatic, economic tools uh, that stop the proliferation of these devices. But clearly one piece of it is we have to have a credible, carefully controlled nuclear capability. And then secondly, I think we have to talk about how we're going to deal with biological and chemical weapons. Uh, during the first Gulf War, all of our military forces were completely capable of operating in a chemical environment with little reduction in our effectiveness. We could fight day and night uh, in full mop. We had the decontamination systems, the technology to, uh, to, to, to deploy and fight in that environment. We weren't going to use chemicals ourselves, as you know. Uh, that capability is now eroded. We've got to think through that. Next one. Want to bring us to our knees? There's only two credible ways to do it. Most of them are fortunately unlikely. Nukes, nuke weapons are very difficult to make. The technology is not hard to understand. But developing fissile material, unless somebody sells you or you steal 40 kilograms of HEU, a nuke weapon is essentially not that tough to put together. When the Libyans turned over their program, it was astonishing how far a third-tier nation had come with a little help from the North Koreans and the Pakistanis. But when it comes to uh, biological weapons, that's not the case. You know, we had one, what we hope was, one mentally unstable scientist at Fort Detrick 
who made what at the time, if you remember the anthrax scare, at the time we were calling that weapons grade anthrax material. You can go to a high school now, in one of these science uh, uh, high schools in a large uh, urban area, and they're doing gene splicing. Uh, so this technology is out there, and we're, in my view, not investing adequately, aggressively. And some of it, by the way, is going to have to be uh, government-operated facilities uh, to develop the capability to deal with these outbreaks as they appear. Next one is cyber warfare. One of our challenges inside the U.S. Armed Forces, when you look at our programs, primarily if it's cyber warfare, we're talking about protecting the U.S. Armed Forces. We're not talking about protecting the U.S. banking system or the New York subway system or somebody's heart pacemaker. Uh, we do not, in my view, have the investment or the uh, organizational strategy as of yet to confront what is the next major area of offensive warfare. We still got some deterrent capabilities. You go out to NSA, that is still the largest concentration of math PhDs on the face of the earth with a terrific and awesome offensive capability. I think that works when you're dealing with most major potential belligerent powers, but it won't work necessarily on terrorist organization, rogue states, or individual attackers. And we see constant attacks, not just on DOD systems, but reconnaissance, electronic reconnaissance throughout our, our economy. We're not doing enough. And then uh, I think, you know, the final one I would sort of underscore is our borders and immigration. It's just amazing to me uh, that, that we look at, uh, there's very much a self-congratulatory and ideological split on how you control borders. You know, here we are a nation of immigrants. Uh, you, pick a number you believe. I'd say that when the sun goes down at night, there's 12 million of us living in this country who are here illegally, maybe more. And hundreds of thousands every year join them. And by the way, half of them don't walk across the Rio Grande River like Donna Shalala and her family. Uh, half of them come in by air and don't go home. And by the way, you go to MIT now and look around the chemistry graduate school program or whatever, and it's heavily foreign students. That's the good news. We want them to stay. So what we, in my judgment, have not done is adequately thought through doing two things at the same time, which is embracing widespread immigration, and yet at the same time establishing controls as most civilized nations do over our borders, our airspace, uh, the entry uh, of students into the country. We just haven't done it. Well, now the manpower there. You know, I, uh, I, when, the border, when I started working on that border issue, 1996, there were a little over 4,000 people in the Border Patrol. That's laughable. I started using a number of 45,000 people. All the attorney generals were outraged for programmatic reasons would ask me the intellectual underpinnings to my argument. I'd say, underpinnings? I just made the number up. What are you talking about? <laughs> it was the same number as the max strength of the NYPD. How could you possibly think you could control in a lawful manner the entry and exit of people across your frontiers if you didn't have the uh, technology and the manpower to do it? So we've got to think through that, and at the same time, it seems to me, we have to recognize that the migration of these talented men and women, you know, tonight when you go have supper, you ought to recognize the only reason we have this powerful agricultural economy still going is Central American and Mexican labor. By the way, it's shameful that they don't have minimum wage and OSHA safety standards and the ability to wire money home to their mother instead of going through a corrupt border system in Mexico. We have to think through control of our frontiers, without which we'll be in trouble. Well, look, you all have paid a lot more attention to me than my family does, <laughs> which I am very grateful for. You know, I like to tell people I'm periodically on NBC News, and uh, my two grown daughters are my substantive feedback loop. And they'll call me on my cell phone when I get off the air Tell me what they thought. And you know, several years ago, I'd been on all day long, uh, and uh, maybe eight o'clock at night, 
and I get off the air at Dirty Rock and the cell phone rings. My older daughter says, Dad, both of us girls are here in Yakima, Washington. And we thought that was a terrific interview. I said, well, that's great. Which one was it? I've been on all day. Dad, we don't know. We always turn the sound off. <laughs> and on that note, the floor is open. Let me uh, listen to your own views and respond to your own questions. OK. And Jim says he's going to identify which questioner looks most uh, astute. Uh, taking uh, questions from the, uh, the internet. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. Uh, and we have a question down here, a question down there. But I, I, wanna, I have one question, uh, so you can take the microphone down there. And in the meantime, let me just start off with this, uh, the first question that somebody sent. It says, you mentioned that public confidence remains high for armed services as the military continues to deal with budget cuts. How can the public, politicians, and military leadership ensure that confidence levels remain high? Well, I think we're in, in a... Uh self-destructive cycle. It's the damnedest thing I've ever seen. I've been associated with business now for 12 years. There is no enterprise of 50 employees or more that's run as illogically as the federal government. It is simply astonishing. For seven years, we have barely ever had any one of the 12 appropriations bills passed before the start of the fiscal year. That's the blueprint. So it's, the, the whole group of you, I don't know, understands this, but if you're dealing with continuing resolutions, that's funding at the same level as last year for the same program. So startups that you're trying to innovate with don't get money. And in theory, you continue funding programs you may have decided to shut down. It is outrageous. Never mind sequestration, uh, which is uh, in the first year was devastating. Half of our F-15 squadrons taxi down to the end of the runway and back, and that's the flying program. And the reason they're doing that is you take a short range reduction, which would be doable, entirely doable. But if you do it in the first year, uh, you can't touch BRAC. You can't fire military people in uniform. You can't get rid of civilian organizations, but you can cut their pay 20%. The only place you can find lots of money is maintenance and training. And if you do that six months into the fiscal year, it, it just the leverage was simply astonishing. And then, of course, there was a corresponding overreaction by the Department of Defense, which exacerbated the problem even worse. I don't know how they're going to break out of this. Both political parties now, I listened to both sides of that debate. Uh, it used to be good politics was good governance. Now I think both those political parties on sequestration at a minimum uh, think it's bad for the country, but they can unload it on the other political party. It is shameful behavior. So we're done. Okay. And I might add that just uh, the administration hadn't turned in a, a believable budget in the entire time they've been in office either. There'd been no attempt to actually face these problems and say, if we're going to cut down the resources, where do we do it logically? Never mind address the entitlement programs, Medicare, Social Security, Med uh, Medicaid. And I remind people that DOD budget was 4.7% of GNP. That's the smallest expenditure of resources in any of the country's wars in our history. World War II, I think it was 36% of GNP, Korea and Vietnam were up in the teens. That's not what's bankrupting the country. It's unsustainable entitlement programs as a general rule. Yes, sir. Sir George Nicholson, good to see you again, sir. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that Admiral Mullen, when he was on active duty and continues to talk about the biggest threat to national security is the national debt. CSIS, in a major event about a year ago, that was hosted by Sam Nunn, had uh, the two chairmen of the two debt commissions, Simpson and Rubin. He had uh, also Secretary Baker. He had uh, Secretary Rubin. Uh, and again, they went down the same line. Uh, do you agree the biggest threat to national security right now is the national debt? Well. You know, he get, I would probably hide behind my uh, argument that I barely understand how the U.S. economy works. Um, certainly in the long term, it's a matter of arithmetic. In the long term, if you don't have some logical way of explaining resource expenditure versus taxation, uh, it won't work. 
and as, as everyone in the room knows, this is unsustainable more than 90 days without the global community investing in our rolling over the national debt. By the way, I see no way for them to actually use that as a lever against us. I mean, it's like setting off a hand grenade in a tent between you and your opponent. So that will continue. Um, having said that, you know, the major challenges on the budget, again, aren't Mike Mullen's DOD budget. They're Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, and retirement systems. And if I grabbed three smart engineers out of the room and gave them five work days, you can come up with a manner to solve those problems. Most of them are three variable problems. Social Security, you get more money or less. You can pay more into it or less. You can get earlier or later. You know, we routinely ask bridge design engineers to, uh, to solve multivariant problems. The difficulty is uh, the political class has to then go to the American people and explain you're getting less and you're getting more. And they're unwilling to do that. I mean, obviously, there has to be an adjustment in taxation. By the way, the Tea Party got born, in my view, because it was deemed not credible that our government would ever solve these problems. I don't know. I think it's a lack of uh, the one problem we have right now, in my view, is our governance, uh, which lacks uh, pragmatic, coherent, long-term planning. They weren't ever very good at it for the last 200 years, but now it's uh, been shameful. Dr. Walser? <laughs> yes, General McCaffrey, Ray Walser, formerly of the Heritage Foundation. I think I had an opportunity to host you, and we discussed Mexico here. So. Coming back a couple of years later, we have seen Uruguay begin to legalize marijuana. We've had the two uh, referendums in Colorado and Washington and are now going into the implementation process. So without going into a long sort of preamble, where do you see drug policy going in the, the rest of the Obama administration? Well, you know, I spend maybe a third of my time in one way or another involved in that issue still. I'm on the board of directors of the National Drug Court System. We've got 3,000 some odd drug courts, thank God. We're now starting veterans treatment courts. I spend a lot of time, in, uh, particularly in effective science-based uh, drug and alcohol treatment. And uh, you know, it's pretty reassuring. We'll do better with uh, alcoholism and, and drug addiction than we do with currently available therapies for oncology. So we actually know how to get people into sobriety and maintain it. Um, the big issue, it seems to me, on drug abuse, by the way, is, you know, more than 300 million of us, most of us don't have a drug or alcohol problem. We just don't. Um, the worst in modern times was around 13% of the country were past month drug users. Now it's probably 7%. For 13 years, we had adolescent drug use going down every year. For the last four years, it's been going up every year. And a lot of that is uh, the end result, in my view, of a debate in which I used to say there were two or 300 people in the country that wanted to normalize the use of illegal drugs. The lead drug was marijuana. But in fact, the, the philosophy behind it was to say, look, this is Darwinian, uh, this is libertarian, uh, if you want to use methamphetamines until you actually break into my house and uh, steal all my electronics, I don't want to do anything about it. So we're moving in that direction. Uh, I think it's a disaster. I think if you're an employer or a parent or an Army first sergeant and you don't think that, uh, by the way, we don't care what drug it is. You know, when you're in, uh, today, uh, when you, I deal with these guys in treatment, it's poly drug abuse. It's alcohol, always the most destructive drug we have, uh, combined with other drugs. We get them into recovery uh, on cocaine, and they'll move to another drug. Uh, so what we care about is drugged, dazed lifestyle in which you're having legal, medical, and social, and work-related problems. Once you're chronically addicted, it is a nightmare. And again, pick a number you believe, there's probably 20 million of us in the country who have a substance abuse problem. So I thought that normalization of uh, drugs, by the way, I called 
the Attorney General and talked to him about it before the election, where he's happy to take my phone call. And, um, and I told him, you know, it's essentially we've acquiesced in not enforcing existing federal law. And by the way, it's also international treaty. It's astonishing what's going on. Um, bad news. I, I watched it happen in Seattle, and I saw my, the former FBI SAC uh, that I had worked with was on pro-marijuana uh, ads along with the U.S. attorney, Kate Flommer. I think the political class uh, looked at the polling data, and there's probably 15% of the country that will vote drug legalization as the dominant issue. They'll vote for you or against you, depending on your stance. I think a lot of them said this is going in the wrong direction and didn't want to stand in front of a train. No leadership. Vice President Biden, a friend, a terrific public servant, hasn't said boo peep about this issue while he's been in office. It's just amazing. So I think a lot of harm is going to come from it, and it may be irreversible. Uh, go look at the work by Dr. Kevin Sabet, S-A-B-E-T. Um, he's a young guy. I, I told people we need a new face on it. We need a new generation to, to address this. So he's doing some very fine work. But it, until you sat in a drug court on a Monday morning and see what happens to your children when they're chronically addicted to drugs, uh, you haven't uh, begun to appreciate the problem. What other thoughts you got? So I have another question from one of our online viewers. Uh, one way the U.S. military hopes to cut its costs is by eliminating some of its overseas bases. What message does this send to our allies, and what message does it send to our adversaries? Um, it's amazing to watch us. Uh, we grab a concept mindlessly and promote it. I thought bringing the uh, armed forces home from Europe and their families was a fundamental error. First of all, it was cheaper to keep them there with NATO paying for the infrastructure. Uh, they were closer to likely deployment uh, opportunities to include the Middle East than they are in Fort Riley, Kansas. And by the way, if you think you're going to save a ton of money bringing our families home and the troops home, you've got to explain to me how you're going to pay for the air and naval power to get them back to the target area. Uh, so I thought it was a fundamental error, and it was sort of a momentum, there's no, there's no congressman voting for a base in Korea, but I'd be astonished if we don't end up off Okinawa, out of South Korea, out of Europe almost entirely. And it, our forward presence in and of itself has military value. We're now going to rotate a brigade through Korea, um, which is uh, sort of a short-term fix. I, you know, if you ask me where tomorrow afternoon uh, a major war could start with almost no prompting, it'd be the Korean Peninsula. So having a, a, a statement of a forward deployed presence, particularly air and naval power, is very important to us. And we're bringing them home. We have a question over here. Uh, good evening, uh, Sergei Kostyev, uh, Moscow, Russia scholar. Uh, my question is about uh, uh, personnel issues in U.S. military. Recently in the news, there were reports about uh, sexual assaults in the military, and some people uh, think that uh, these complaints should be taken out of the chain of command. And what's your take on this issue? Thanks. Well, you know, I, uh, first of all, 14% uh, of the U.S. Armed Forces are now women. Uh, we've had 152 killed in action and over 1,000 wounded in action. Uh, women are, when you look at them statistically as a group, uh, they're better soldiers than men are less in discipline, uh, personal courage is, is absolutely not a factor. Um, they've been a tremendous additive uh, capability to the force. And it's moving, generally speaking, in the right direction. And they're all volunteers, by the way, the men and the women. We had, I went in and saw a very senior official in the Department of Defense about the 26,000 sexual assaults figure. Um, and part of this is not just from being a commander in the uh, armed forces, but having a daughter who's a major in the armed forces. Uh, I would argue that the U.S. armed forces are the most dignified, safe, and responsible place for a young woman of any institution in our society, far more so uh, than major university campuses, where you got young people unsupervised with alcohol. 
I think that when we looked at that study on sexual assault, they categorized in one clump military sexual trauma, which included unwanted touching and language up through forcible uh, assault. They extrapolated and got 3,000 responses to their survey. More men than women complained of military sexual trauma, which was swept off the table, I might add. Uh, and then they extrapolated from there and came up with 26,000 uh, sexual assaults. It's a bogus figure. They know it. They don't want to stand in front of the train on that one either. But, uh, Senator Gilbreth, who's I'm sure a sincere, talented woman, has no clue what she's talking about. Uh, and it's really a tremendous challenge to the force. Obviously, we want the chain of command to be held accountable for all their soldiers men and women, and uh, I think we'll get that out of it. So we're in a period of uh, you know, just uh, ideological warfare going on right now. But you know, I, and I see it all the time. I had some guy come up to me and said his daughter had just got an appointment to Annapolis, and was it safe for her to go there? I mean, honestly, this breaks my heart to hear this kind of language. Of course it's safe for your girl to go to Annapolis. I don't know. We've got to think through this. And, I, I think there's, I'm disappointed the chain of command hadn't stopped, stepped forward and said something about it. Chief Staff of the Army said the number one uh, mission of the United States Army was to combat sexual harassment. We've got 65,000 troops in combat in Afghanistan. So I don't know. Well, we, normally we puzzle through this at the end of the day, but the biggest uh, conclusion I would leave you with is I've seen these troops in combat in Iraq or Afghanistan, every year I've been in the combat zone, they're doing a phenomenal job. They're flying attack helicopters, they get shot, they continue with the mission, they're getting silver stars in combat, they're a huge additive capability. And they're four-star admiral, woman, four-star general army, they're going to help manage this uh, big force. Thank God because of it. What else you got? I've got one more um, question from online. So someone is asking that, by some accounts, uh, upwards of two-thirds of young men and women are, wouldn't be eligible for military service. And does that concern you at all in, in the future of the force? Well, it's, it's a good comment, uh, Jim. Uh, you know, when you talk to recruiting command, essentially, we recruit uh, young men from the top 15% of the country. So we had a couple, three bad years during the height of Iraq where we were, I, my take at the time was 10% of the people we were bringing into the Army shouldn't have been in uniform. Uh, but that was a, a momentary challenge we had as the credibility of the fighting in Iraq deteriorated. And boys and girls are telling each other, don't go in the Army, or don't go in the Marine Corps. Uh, so we, we had a problem, but by and large, top 15%, no felony arrest. Uh, GT, psychiatric strain, et cetera. Top 10% of young women. So we're after the same kids that are going to go to George Mason University. And we're getting them. And you can see it in the field. They are unbelievably competent and capable and team players. Uh, and by the way, I always remind people now we're running 59,000 killed and wounded. And some of these units get 10, 20, 25% killed and wounded during the deployment depending on where they are and what period of these wars. So they're, they're really phenomenal. Now we get them in, there's another problem. This is a new generation. They're couch potatoes. They're used to, they're uh, using electronic uh, games and communications. They don't phone each other. They don't meet. They don't get driver's licenses. They uh, talk to each other in texts and tweets and toofs and whatever. <laughs> um, they're on too many medications. So we get them into Fort Leonard Wood or Fort Jackson or Fort Benning, not Fort Benning, so, uh, but the other uh, basic training places, and we have to get them off their meds and toughen them up, and we're running some preliminary programs to get them physically fit. Now, you, uh, now, there's a change of that, though. You go to Fort Benning and look at the infantry OSIT course, and you're looking at America's lacrosse and soccer teams and football teams. They are unbelievable uh, physically fit uh, kids. And by the way, there's a secret that I normally try and conceal from a civilian audience. The reason they enlisted in the Marine Corps or Special Ops or direct enlistment for the Ranger Regiment or for the 82nd Airborne 
is they want to fight. That's why they came in. Oh, that, that also blends into the, ar the armed forces are being portrayed now widely as a victim of 12 years of combat. PTSD is real. Traumatic brain injury, TBI, is new and real. You wouldn't have survived an IED blast of 300 kilograms of explosives on a vehicle IED uh, in another war. Now, because of body armor and MRAPs and unbelievable Medicare, we keep people alive. So these new phenomena are there. But again, to try and put these things in context, um, suicide rates in the armed forces tend to be barely above the civilian counterpart of the same age. By the way, the dramatic statement is it's gone up over 50% in the last decade, and so has the suicide rate in America, which is worth discussing. Why is that? Um, PTSD, uh, we, we've seen this in every war we fought. You know, if you get both your feet blown off and you're partially blind, and the difference now is that soldier who's so damaged has a wife and a two-year-old, and the payment out of the VA system will be $1,200 a month, medically retired E-4, 82nd Airborne Division. The amount of money we're giving these kids is barely adequate to, I got this from one of their wives, uh, barely adequate to pay the cab fee uh, to his ongoing treatment at Bethesda. So we got to rethink uh, traumatic and PTSD injuries, but we're being rolled on this. Your armed forces is the healthiest institution in American society. All right, Colonel Mr. Slav, to be the last question. Well, sir, I wanted to ask you the question, uh, especially with Colonel McGinley sponsoring the lecture here, and this being the McGinley lecture from the Marine Corps and sponsored by the Marine Corps Foundation. It's interesting that we have a four-star Army general presenting this. Could you comment on the evolution of the joint force since you've been commissioned and the working together of the armed forces and how you see that going forward in the future? Well, that's a, that's a great way to phrase that because it has been uh, the, the uh, joint concept. When I, I was an Army strategic planner right after uh, the great new law, Goldwater Nichols, was passed against the determined opposition of all the chiefs of services. I remember as an Army War College student, the uh, chief staff of the Army, a wonderful man, telling us why he was going to commit Harry Carey before he'd see that passed. Then, then I was a strategic planner, and I remember I had three colonels whose job it was to prop up my weak spine, and they'd send me down to the, as the dep op dep to the tank on these debates. And one of them was, and I was to go down there and prevent that bastard Admiral Crowell uh, from this horrific thing he was about to do. I said, what's the horrific thing? Well, he said, he's going to start signing documents as the chairman instead of for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I did what I normally do is I read the document in particular and said, you know, I appears that the law allows him to do that. <laughs> so I'm not quite sure why I should be so determined in my opposition to the good admiral. Um, I was, uh, I guess, Jim, you and I were talking about, I was in uh, Ramadi, and there was an Army brigade that had been uh, handed over to the Marines uh, Striker Brigade, if I remember. One of the battalion task force, it was an Army battalion with four Marine rifle companies. There was another Marine battalion that had three Army companies attached to it. So, I, uh, by the way, I think the sort of esprit de corps and unit pride that makes it so obnoxious to be around the 82nd Airborne <laughs> or most Marine units. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's painful. Uh, <laughs> if you're a leg within 100 miles of the 82nd, you're worse than human pond scum. Uh, so some of that is useful, but as a general statement, the joint force actually works now at every level. Uh, and people are comfortable putting their forces under the command of a different service. It's been a real multiplier. And I think it's going to be even more important as we see this force get uh, put at risk uh, by size. Um, I'll let, I, I feel very good about where that joint doctrine and interoperability has gone, mostly under the pressure of real-world combat, uh, which is a great equalizer. 
Well, I, I have a different answer for Mike's question. I've spent a lot of times with the Marines, and what I've learned is that the Marines, all they care about is leadership, and they'll go anywhere to find it. And even, fighting. Even the Army. Yeah. The, the other thing I tell the Army guys, if you get a Marine battalion pulling in your flight, right flank, be happy about it, because these guys will fight. Well, this is a lecture on leadership, and I don't think we could have had a more outstanding example. You've covered everything from nuclear weapons to, to drug policy to foreign policy issues to about young men and women. So I, I think we've got more than money's worth. So I want to ask you to join me in thanking General McCaffrey. Thanks very much. Thanks very much.